Good. 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 Okay. Just okay. That's good. That's good. I'm glad that you're here. I don't know if you're glad that you're here, but I'm glad that you're here. So this morning, we want to take some time and we want to look at bringing down the house. Right. Of course, it would have to be a song there for Alex to have the discernment after. But today, we're going to look at bringing down the house. And, you know, I've just been thinking about this and meditating about this. I've been in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in Matthew chapter 10 for the last three or four weeks. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10 has kind of captured my attention over the last, um, I don't know, three or four days here. And just looking at this idea of bringing down the walls, bringing down strongholds in our lives. And, you know, for some of us here this morning, you know, it, it's a family stronghold. I mean, we find you at 102 Stronghold Lane. It's been up for years and years and years, and it's been there, and that's the way that it is. And there's no denying that. There's no arguing with that. That's just where you're at. For some of you this morning, maybe you don't even realize that you've got a stronghold up, but you do. Is it hot in here? Okay. I'm just thinking, okay, maybe I'm just nervous, but I feel kind of warm. Anyway, so before we come to the Word of God, before we really get into this, I just want to ask you all just to pray with me here. You know, here, so just let's take a moment to still our hearts. I just want you to pray for yourself. Pray that God opens your ears to hear exactly what He wants you to hear. And pray for me, please, that uh, God would just. Pour into me the words that he desires for me to hear. So God changes this morning. Change me. You're in heaven. You do whatever you want. You're going to do it for your glory. I'm convinced of this fact that you have a plan. It's not about me. It's not about anybody in this room. But it doesn't follow us. And that plan is about living out your glory for this moment. God, I just pray that you bring that in the house. You bring that in the house. So when I was about eight years old, my dad bought me a go-kart. And um, I was stoked about this go-kart. But there was a lot of work that had to go into it to prepare it before I could ride it. So I'm telling all of my friends about my new go-kart. Some of you didn't realize that I had a go-kart. I had it for one trip. That's all I had it for. It just took me one time of riding this thing before I figured out, you know what, maybe riding go-karts is not for me. So anyway, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I'm telling everybody about this go-kart that I've got. I'm just really excited to have this go-kart and to you know, be able to ride it and all this, all this stuff. So the, the day finally comes when the go-kart is ready. And my dad uh, brings it out here to the parking lot in the back. And I'm, I want to be first. All my friends are out here with me. But I want to be the first person to ride the go-kart. And so I get on this go-kart. And everybody's told me this go-kart is really, really fast. And they're like, I'm not going to say this is good for an eight-year-old to be riding this go-kart, right? So I got this, I got this. So I get on it and so I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe I'll listen to these people and I'll, I'll take it nice and slow. So I start taking it nice and slow. And uh, one of my friends decided he'd be a smart aleck. And so he decided that he would race me on foot. So he's running next to the thing going, no, I'm faster than you are. Right? And so I'm like, you oh, know what? Punk, I got this. I hammered down that boat. I took off across through there. Only problem was when I took my foot off the accelerator, it didn't stop accelerating. <laughs> And I said something along the lines of, oh, dear. <laughs> right? And, and so I said something along those lines. And so I'm freaking out at this moment in time. And I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Well, I turn it around, and I head back towards everybody there. And I'm thinking, Dad will know what to do. And I lock in on my dad, and I have a beat on him. And I'm going at him. And let me tell you that if you've ever wondered what it looks like when you play a chicken with a go-kart, let me tell you the chicken stage. Ready? <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I'm like, I'm coming at him, he's like this. I'm thinking, Dad, will stop it, you'll fix it. He does. He jumps out of the way. He goes, get the kill switch. <laughs> I was like, this thing's got a kill switch? Hit this kill switch and I stop it. Okay. I'm coming off that thing, I look like I've got Parkinson's disease, right? I'm so bad. And so I, I get off with the go kart and I'm. I'm Walking around just trying to calm myself down, and my dad's like, Man, why were you doing this? I'm like, I didn't know what else to do. I knew you could stop it and all this stuff. I, I just remember just kind of like wiping this stuff out. And he's like, Why did you hit the kill switch? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, after about an hour of working on it, they got it back running, and my friends were taking turns in the go kart, and it came back around in my turn. I 
said, no, no, it's, it's okay. You know, you had fun. I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> and came back around to my turn again. I'm like, no, no, it's okay, really. I mean, I, I've had my turn. I've had my fun. You, you, guys, you guys keep going. And my dad pulled me aside. He said, Alex, why aren't you riding the real car? I'm like, well, I just don't want to be selfish. I want everybody to have a chance. And I want everybody to be able to be a part of this. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, something I just want to share with them. He goes, I didn't buy the go-kart for that. I bought the go-kart for you. I want you to ride the go-kart. Once you get on it, give it another try. I wasn't really sure about this. But at the same time, I was like, okay, it is mine. And I do, I do want to get back on the it. And why do I tell you the story except to, oh, let me finish the story again. So I jumped back on the go-kart. I tell you what, I own that puppy. I was a beast on the go-kart from that, on, that point on. But why do I tell you that? It's not just to kind of wake you up on a Sunday morning. All of us have different things in our life that have come up at some point in time. And God has placed a calling on our life. Each person in here, if you're a believer this morning, you have a calling on your life. And something maybe has come up in your life and you kind of shut off. Because it affected you in a way that was negative and you didn't like that. Right? I mean, we've all been there. And you just begin to push aside and push away everything because it didn't happen the way that you wanted to. So I've got two questions for you this morning. They're actually the same question, but they're directed at different people because they're kind of worried. First one is this. Are you living beneath your calling? You know, God's put a calling on your life. Are you living beneath it? Are you kind of like I was with the go-karts? Like, no, I don't want to be selfish. I'll just share this with everybody, you know. And I'll let everybody else have a part in this. Maybe your calling is just to be a wife and a mother or a father and a husband. That's a noble calling. Are you present in the moment, living out the glory of God in that calling? Maybe your calling for this moment is just to be the best son and brother that you can be, or the best daughter and sister that you can be, and as Romans chapter 12 says, uh, outdo everybody and show him honor. You know? And where's the greatest influence that you can have? It's in your home, right? Because anybody else, I mean, I can get up here on this platform every Sunday morning and live by myself and live like a dirt bag throughout the week and get up here and everybody thinks I'm marvelous. But when I go home and people see who I really am, that's where I make an impact. That's where I influence people. And see, some of us were living beneath our calling. Maybe it's because of burnout. Let me tell you what burnout is. Burnout is very simply put this way. It's misplaced expectations. Misplaced expectations. You expected your calling to go this way, and it went this way. And now you're burned out, and you're going, you know, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. You know, I, I, I don't want to step back. I don't want to be selfish. I'm going to step back. You've got a strong home in your life. Are you hiding from your calling? Now, for some of you in here, it's salvation. That's, a, that's one of the ways that you hide from your calling. No, this isn't for me. Or maybe you're like the Athens, the people in Athens, and Paul went and spoke to them and asked. And they said, you know what? You tell us about this no name God, and that's really interesting, but we'll hear more of that tomorrow. And you hide from your calling because God's reaching into your heart and He's telling you something, but you keep putting stuff up, saying, no, that's not me. And you get on the boat and you go to Tarshish, right? I've been there. I've been there. And you start looking for anything else to do, and you hide from it. When well, anytime we come to the Word of God, there are two things that we must always do. Two things we must always do if it's corporate, if it's private. And it's always listen and respond. Listen and respond. I can help you with both, but I can't do one of them for you. So to help you with your listening, you can hear me clap twice.